United we are as strong as a mountain. Uh, Elizabeth Milos is, is an interpreter. Uh, she's a member of the CWA UPTI, Unit of Professional Technical Employees at UCSF. She was a delegate uh, to the San Francisco Labor Council and outspoken for Palestinian people against the repression uh, and against the relationship of the AFL-CIO to the Histor Group, which is the Israeli Trade Union Federation, which they support. It's a apartheid trade union organization uh, that supports the apartheid policies. In fact, it supported the apartheid regime in South Africa, the Histor Group, and actually had a I was manufacturing arms and military equipment in South Africa, supporting the apartheid regime. This is the Histed route, with the support of the Israeli government. And unbeknownst to most, that the AFL-CIO was also supporting the apartheid regime. Chief Boothalese and Inkata were given millions of dollars uh, to organize armed gangs of thugs who then murdered uh, South African trade unionists in Kosatu who are organizing unions. Uh, Elizabeth is also on the board of uh, KPFA, the local station board. Uh, she returned after she was illegally removed from the board <laughs> in an effort to silence her. Uh, she got her position back. And since that time, the KPFA has put on Ian Masters, who's a pr propagandist for the CIA and the FBI. I don't believe he's ever had, he's on nine hours a week on KPFA and I don't ever believe he's had a, a black person on as a guest or a Latino on as a guest. So they put a, I would say, a racist and a, a, a supporter of uh, U.S. imperialism on the air at KPFA. And Elizabeth, at the last board meeting, raised this and asked the manager there why he had appointed this guy. And the manager, Antonio, said, uh, well, he was, it was easy to do because they did their own editing. Uh, for his program. So uh, nine hours a, a week, there's no Palestinian program. Uh, there are segments, uh, but they've got time for uh, Ian Masters. So there's going to be a slate called Rescue Pacifica, which I'm a part of, and also uh, Elizabeth is a part of, that's running in the KPFA election. And she has taken up a fight, as I said, in her union, UPTI, and in the San Francisco Labor Council, and faced numerous obstacles, which she's going to be talking about. So welcome to our program. Elizabeth. Hello. Thank you very much. I, I would like to say that I'm also Chilean American and I'm recovering from COVID. I'm Chilean American and uh, I'm among the other things that uh, Steve mentioned regarding Israel. Um, I became aware early on of Israeli apartheid's role uh, in selling arms to Pinochet in the 70s, as well as in the 80s, they sold arms to the Rios Mont government as well, to Guatemala. Uh, the United States that used Israel as its uh, as its uh, as its state to sell through via that those means when it wasn't allowed to sell the arms directly. What I wanted to say is, I was a member of the San Francisco Labor Council as a delegate from UPTI, my union, Union of, of University and Professional and Technical Employees (CWA 9119). I'm a medical interpreter at UCSF. Um, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, we had uh, in May 19th, 2021, there was the uh, United Educators of San Francisco delegates meeting had passed a really good resolution in favor of Palestine, in favor of BDS, which was uh, very hard hit by, uh, by media, uh, but the uh, educators stood strong, the delegates uh, stood strong. And after that, uh, our union, through its social justice committee, um, passed a resolution and sent it to the executive board for June 2nd, uh, a BDS resolution as well, and to stop military aid and specifically to break ties with Histradute as well. Um, as a member of the Labor Council, we had decided by uh, we we had decided in the social justice committee that we would send it to the Labor Council, and so I joined forces with. Um, members of many different unions I have here on the screen, if you want me to share the screen or, uh, about the actual resolution that we presented to the Labor Council on June 14, 2021, which incorporated the, the immense uh, uh, wellspring, the, the immense um, emerging younger people that were joining the unions. Uh, there was now uh, Unite Here, Local 23, representing 25,000 hospitality workers across Southern and Southwestern US had issued a statement in solidarity with Palestinians and their struggle against oppression and justice. 
Teamsters Local 804 from New York City, which represented 8,000 workers, uh, mostly UPS workers, drivers. The News Guild also uh, had, the, had made a, a which represented 24,000 journalists uh, across North America called the May 15th Israeli Defense Force intentional bombing of Gaza Tower, housing the offices of the Associated Press in Al Jazeera, a blatant attack on press freedom. Google members, all this resolution incorporated all the different unions throughout the country that have been um, that have been voicing their concerns and their opposition to Israeli apartheid in many different ways. Some calling it apartheid, some not, but most calling for an end to the aid. Um, and when we presented this resolution, uh, we had joined together with um, many different unions, uh, delegates from the Labor Council, including OPEIU, AFT 2121, uh, SEIU, APWU, IBU, uh, ILW, uh, the Inland Boat, Boat Workers Union. Um, the, uh, there was signatories from the Media Guild, um, as, as well as from Yahtzee and LACLA, as well as my union and C uh, California Faculty Association uh, and uh, the letter carriers and the uh, NUHW, um, as well as supported by mem uh, by for ID titles, uh, the president of ILWU Local 10 um, and um, the um, uh, retirees, uh, Clarence Thomas from ILWU Local 10 as well and Marcus Holder and Christopher Christensen. Uh, from ILWU. They were all present uh, in this resolution. And uh, we encountered uh, difficulties in being able to get the necessary people uh, uh, into the uh, Labor Council at the same time we were dealing with um, the Labor, the, we were in communication with many different organizations. This came um, um, during the period of time or right after the period of time that in May had been the block the boat. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry, the, the um, not the block the boat, the, the, um, the meeting that had been happening on a nationwide level in trying to um, um, stop this from happening. This, this meeting happened at the, um, at the level of uh, labor against war and racism. Um, and we try to uh, get as many people involved in this as possible by sending notices to all the different members of, um, of the uh, Arabic organizations as well and um, an answer as well. And unfortunately, the delegates who had been recently um, voted in uh, at the UESF uh, as uh, delegates to, the, to be the, the delegates, the, the new executive board, were not able to be uh, sworn in until later, until after the vote. Um, they were voted in, I believe, in August. They had decided they were be going to be voted in in August. Um, the, the situation that we encountered was uh, very disheartening because when we presented this resolution, we immediately got tabled by an APAC supporter from Local 87, um, um, Miranda, uh, Olga Miranda, who is an openly APAC supporter. And the committee that was supposedly assigned to it, the, the previous, the member of the executive board, uh, Susan Solomon uh, from UESF at the time, she had not been elected to the new board, but she was still in the executive board. She was given co-chairman of this of this committee, um, and basically, it was sent to redraft this uh, this this resolution. Um, my union had already passed the resolution, but we had decided among the delegates to present this new resolution because it incorporated all the different unions from the country and incorporated. Um, all the delegates. It was a contribution from all the delegates that signed on to it. Um, and this was sent to, immediately to committee. And supposedly there was going to be something coming out of it that would reflect the, the agreements um, of making it a, a resolution that the San Francisco Labor Council could pass. But our bottom line was it had to include BDS and stopping aid to Israel. Well, immediately after that, we had um, 
Rudy Gonzalez from the Building and Trade state publicly in a, in a, in a, a Jewish bulletin, I believe, uh, that BDS is off the table um, and basically uh, denigrating the resolution and, and not uh, supporting it, even though he was supposed to be part of the team that was going to be working on this new committee to do this. Um, and of course, um, what happened afterwards was that we got a letter from the AFL-CIO prohibiting the Labor Council from even uh, discussing this resolution. Uh, this was an official letter with the letterhead of the AFL-CIO stating that the AFL-CIO does not permit the Labor Council to cover uh, uh, issues that, that where they have already taken a policy decision. And this goes against the, the the Labor Council, the San Francisco Labor Council history of um, this, uh, of, of being able to present uh, its, uh, its positions, its political positions, even from the days of the Vietnam War, they, uh, they opposed the Vietnam War while the um, Labor Council, while the AFL-CIO had supported the Vietnam War. Um, well, as a result of what happened in the Labor Council, um, we were not able to bring that forward. But as Professor Rabi mentioned, we were able to bring it forward. It had to do with the labor issues at San Francisco State, which was a, a good, which was a really good victory there, and being able to protect that as well. Um, but they uh, they were not able to stop that because that directly had to do with labor issues here uh, in San Francisco, um, and. The, um, the, what happened basically after that was um, we had agreed at the Social Justice Committee uh, that we were going to take our resolution. Uh, we were gonna take, right, the Department of Equity and Inclusion, correct. Um, we had agreed that we were gonna take our resolution to the CWA convention, which was gonna be in, uh, Yes, Nora, I will be providing uh, links to those or the actual documents instead, because uh, I'll explain in a minute uh, about the link to the resolution. Um, the resolution that my union passed, we were gonna bring that one to the CWA convention, but uh, because there was other resolutions that had been passed by the Colorado branch of the CWA, as well as other uh, CWA chapters, there was uh, a decision to join forces and create a new one in which uh, I wrote one up, I drafted one up, which included history, do, included all the different things as, as well as footnotes, because, you know, be honest, we, we knew that it did not have a chance of passing, but we wanted it to make sure that we included as much information as possible so that it, 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 when it could be in the hands of our delegates, which was, by the way, the CWA convention last year was, excuse me, last time, was through Zoom, so there was no way of talking with people directly. Um, and they, uh, well, we went, we had a meeting with the resolutions committee and they listened to us and we had people come into the resolutions committee to speak in favor of this resolution. And we had a very long meeting, which was very interesting because it seemed like they were really listening at that time. However, once it was brought to the floor, um, Unfortunately, the same members uh, of my delegation, um, the one of the members who was the chair of the uh, Peace and Justice Committee actually refused to second that motion, that the motion of me bringing it to the floor. Uh, she felt that it did not have enough support and so she didn't think it was gonna be worth doing it. I got the second from somebody from outside of my delegation and um, after that, we did not have a social justice committee anymore at the system-wide level in my committee, in my, in my union, after October of 2021, after the CWA convention. At that CWA convention, mind you, I also saw there was a resolution that they had presented, that CWA had presented, um, giving money to the so-called Solidarity Center uh, to support union organizing in authoritarian regimes such as Colombia, Philippines, and they mentioned Cuba. And so I basically did a motion to strike. I, I 
I wasn't going to be able to uh, get rid of that entire resolution, of course. So I did a motion to strike Cuba off of the word there. And I gave a five minute speech and where I did expose the AFL-CIO's involvement in uh, interference and interventions uh, through the National Endowment for Democracy um, and um, in support of Cuba and also expose them for their uh, role in Chile. Um, and so I took that opportunity to do so. And the, uh, the word Cuba was, uh, the, Basically, the motion to strike did not pass, but the another member of the CWA was able to get rid of all of the names of the countries that were listed there. So we were able to at least get rid of that. Um, so after the uh, CWA October 2021 uh, meeting uh, convention, the Social Justice Committee ceased to exist. There was no meeting, even though I was my repeated attempts to get it started again, sending emails, emails, emails to the new president that we had. And then recently, um, recently, uh, I mean, the whole website was changed. And so when as somebody's asking me for links, I can provide you the, with the actual documents, but not with the link to our website, because the resolutions that were passed by, by my, by all the resolutions that were passed by my, uh, com my union's conventions, have been deleted from the website. And they're still discussing of whether or not they're gonna include it. That includes resolutions that we passed um, uh, against the privatized retirement systems in Chile, which was in March, 2019. It includes the resolutions that we passed against energy transfer partners, uh, Standing Rock, uh, after uh, I went there and present the resolution afterwards to the convention in, 20, um, in, in, in 2016. Uh, 2017, sorry, it was a January one. And that includes also a resolution, uh, the recent one in October 2021, uh, I'm sorry, in the, the, the last year's resolution at my convention was um, around the privatization of Laguna Honda. So all of those different resolutions have been disappeared as well as all of the historic resolutions from the La San Francisco Labor Council you go on the Labor Council and I still have not been able to find the resolutions, the historic resolutions that have been going, that, that the Labor Council has been creating, has, create, has done in these past few years. Um, there, is, uh, there is, it's much more notorious than just progressives except for Palestine. The situation is that they're silencing the votes of the rank and file. They're silencing the votes of convention decisions, which supposedly, according to most union bylaws, are the law of the land. In other words, they're higher than any president or any, it should be the, 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 the highest power of any union delegation is the actual conventions and the decisions that are made at the convention level. Unfortunately, uh, the latest, the last convention at my union um, I was not able to be a delegate. I was um, isolated from being a delegate. Um, in March 8th, I was taken out of being a San Francisco Labor Council delegate by my own union executive committee. Um, they had been getting a lot of complaints by the executive committee of the Labor Council uh, against me. And the last one was due to a resolution that I had tried to bring forth on for Mumia where the Labor Council refused to pass that vote on Mumia, um, re refused to, to, and they voted against the resolution. Unfortunately, some of the people who we consider allies also voted against it. Um, and I, you know, I, I can only say that this is um, not only disheartening, but it's, it seems that um, we really need to get our, our, our unity going. We need to be united in, in our struggle. Uh, and um, especially when it comes to internationalism um, and the, the issue of internationalism is, is also something very strong that we brought forward regarding the ILWU and the anti-privatization. Um, people don't realize that it hits home. It hits home directly. People in Chile suffered targeting of the eyes. Journalists got targeted in the eyes. 500 people had loss of one eye through the police. 
that's the same tactic with that, that the Chilean police learned from Israel, as well as the United States. I mean, they learned, they teach each other, basically. Um, Israelis, the Israeli army are targeting people's legs and knees and making people um, dis disabled for life. The same, um, the same could be said with a shot in the eye squad of people that got shot in the eye during the George Floyd protest by police and by tear gas canisters. Uh, Jewish Voice for Peace put out a very important, um, the deadly exchange report, which shows exactly how much training happens and how much military equipment gets passed from the Israeli apartheid regime to the US and attacks uh, black and brown people here. Um, so the issue of solidarity is very important and it's directly tied to Zionism, to neo-Nazism as well. Um, the same people that um, are unfortunately are gaining ground in Chile at this moment, which is the neo-Nazi enclave, uh, Felipe Cast, um, are the same ones who back in the day, AFL-CIO paid these trucker owners $50 a day to strike against the Allende government in the south of Chile, specifically there, they have an enclave, enclave called APRA, an association of, of business leaders of the forestry companies that are attacking the Mapuche communities and militarizing the Mapuche people in Chile and, and using tactics uh, against the, the October uh, 2019 protests using uh, sodium hydroxide in the uh, water cannons, which burned people's skin. Those are the same kind of tactics that have been used against Palestinians. Um, we are all in this fight together. Uh, and if we do not stick together, we will die, literally die. And we, we need to st stay strong and united um, as much as, as we can. And we, because we have one enemy um, and that's the important thing that we need to understand. Um, thank you. I'm not sure how much time I have left, so I didn't want to take too much time. Okay, maybe maybe you can wrap it up because we do want to have some questions and, and comments of uh, our participants, and not only our participants, but our uh, attendees. So um, look, why don't we, can you wrap it up briefly? Yeah, I, I, I I guess I'm, you know, I, I would like to leave some space for comments, yeah, or questions instead. Yeah, I'll okay. allow people to. Um, if you think I've missed anything, if anybody thinks I missed something. Well, I do want to add um, yeah. that thanks for your for your report. And it's it's obviously, this is the only place that this is going to be heard. Uh, because this is not just about Palestine and Chile. It's about what's going on right here in our own unions. And right. who doing what in our own unions? So that is a critical question. But also I think that there's a group, group called uh, Labor Education Project and AFL-CIO International Operations, uh, which is going to be having an educational conference on September the 10th in Washington, DC on these issues of the role of the AFL-CIO in, uh, in Israel, in South Africa, in Chile, uh, and in Mexico. I, I and on, on the September the 11th, there's going to be a rally actually at the AFL-CIO on the 50th anniversary of the Chilean coup uh, to open the books, to end the $75 million a year uh, that the AFL-CIO gets from the National Endowment for Democracy um, to uh, hold accountable the uh, AFL-CIO leadership for actually helping to kill and jail thousands of trainees in Chile and many other countries. Um, because uh, most workers in the United States are unaware of that. So I would hope that Dr. Cornell West could participate on the September 11th and the 50th anniversary of the uh, coup in Chile to let people know there's another 9-11, which most Americans are unaware of, uh, that happened in Chile, which was the overthrow of that government. So when we talk about overthrowing governments, here's an example uh, for the American people about the AFL-CIO and the US government overthrowing the elected government in, in Chile. So um, I think that that's, uh, if people could. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to add one last thing if I can. Yeah. I, it's also very, very uh, troubling to see that so-called progressives on the KPFA protectors was running under the protectors in KPFA. Um, they refuse on the LSB, they refuse to support uh, 
Frank Sterling is a Native American man who's journalist who was uh, attacked by police in Antioch and we put a resolution to get his support by KPFA directly. And, um, and unfortunately uh, they refused that, but they, they took away the program called uh, First Voice Apprenticeship Program, um, but they, which was uh, Frank Sterling's, he's a technical director of that program uh, a very important social justice program that was uh, set up for teaching uh, young uh, people uh, for broadcasting and social justice issues. And instead they gave nine hours a week to Ian Masters uh, uh, program. Um, Ian Masters as a CIA uh, linked person who brings forth CIA and FBI people and who believes that Mumia Abu Jamal is guilty. Um, so, and who was on KPFK previously and who had asked people not to donate to KPFK and was participating and is continues to participate in trying to destroy Pacifica. People need to realize the, the power of media and how it affected the vote in Chile and by these incredible bots that were used and, and the uh, media conglomerates and the amount of money that was poured into trying to convince people to vote against a new constitution that was had been presented and had been created uh, by the constituent um, uh, constitutional convention. Um, so it, it, it is very troubling in the, in the level of, 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 of support that this uh, guy Ian Masters has. And um, I just wanna, want you to say, want, want, want you to know that, uh, that we need to make sure we um, address this because people go around with progressive faces, but in essence, they are uh, destroying the one they're trying to destroy the one remaining terrestrial independent radio network in the country, Pacifica. Um, so we're asking people to uh, vote not against New Day, against uh, the uh, protectors and uh, Pacifica Safety Net, and uh, in favor of those who are uh, fighting for a united Pacifica. Thank you, Elizabeth. Our first speaker, uh, Carol Lang, is a professor at CUNY. Carol? Hi, everybody. Um, whatever you guys are suffering in San Francisco, it's all over the country. I mean, there's a policy that's anti-Palestinian, and it's not only unspoken, but it's spoken. <clears throat> so a number of years back during another atrocity, every day there's an atrocity. Uh, I'm on the International Committee of my union, which is the P Professional Staff Congress. We wrote a resolution in defense of the Palestinians and in opposition to the Israeli attacks. Um, I mean, eventually we mostly agreed on the wording. And as soon as we put it out there to get the executive committee to vote on it, it was like, it, it, no way, ma'am, were they gonna vote on it? And not only was were they not gonna vote on it or they voted against it, but there was a lot of backlash. So we have newspapers in New York, like the Daily News that are, you know, taking pictures of people who are raising their hands in support of Pal I mean, it was really bizarre. Um, and so the, the resolution never went anywhere. Um, people threatened to drop out of the union, 200 people dropped out of the union. And our attitude was, if, the, if you're this reactionary, please leave, you know? So we weren't upset at all about it. Um, but just recently, um, at the last law school graduation in New York, uh, there was a woman whose name is Fatima Mohammed, who was elected to give the, you know, the talk to the to the graduating class, and she. Um, it was wonderful. She talked about Israeli apartheid and and how it supported, you know. Um, uh, South African apartheid and how we're a social justice school. So we want to fight for social justice for everybody and anybody it's in YouTube. You can listen to it. As soon as she gave that talk, she got lots and lots of death threats. She was in hiding for some time. Um, and, you know, we all wrote a Two things happened after that in, that were important in my union. We, some of us, wrote a, another resolution in support of Fatima, um, and we had asked 
that the chancellor, the mayor, the chancellor, everybody came out swinging against Fatima. She was a racist and she was prejudiced and anti-Semitic and the whole, you know, litany of, of attacks. And um, instead of my union standing up and defending her, we had to force the principal officers to write something as milk toast as you could possibly find. We support the right of free speech. They didn't mention her name. They didn't mention what was happening to her. None of that. So at the last delegate assembly meeting, the resolution that people supported, we tried to get onto the agenda. And um, in order to be able to get it onto the agenda, to, to it was a new business. So we wanted to get it to the top of the agenda. There had to be three um, um two thirds vote in support of moving the agenda. In the meantime, now we have no meetings because it's the summer. So there's nothing, you know, to support Fatima, even though there's a lot of, you know, people are doing different things in order to, to support her. But, but the unions, which has the millions of people in them that has the ability to get the word out as far and wide as they can, has made a decision not to hear that resolution until September, and who knows what's going to happen between now and then, but their response to the to the chancellor and the mayor who attacked her viciously was absolutely milquetoast. So, you know, it's like with everything else that they do, which is absolutely nothing. They basically... Um, I mean, they don't even fight for their own members. I'm not even going to go into what's happening at CUNY because it's so awful. And probably if you know what's happening in San Francisco, you know what's happening at CUNY. It's the same kind of attacks, especially we're a working class Black Latin school, right? The same. Um, but come September, um, we're going to definitely mobilize and make sure that that resolution is on the top of the agenda as opposed to in new business because you know, there if if the union leadership has anything to do with anything, they'll bury the resolution. They'll put it to a place where it's impossible to get to because the agenda is too long. And so, as as reactionary as there are a number of people in my union who are really Zionists, there are lots of people activists who are especially you know, energized around this particular question of the Palestinians. And so I have every expectation that there'll be more movement in September since everything is, right. nothing happens in the summer, right? Except for the contract and all of that, right? All that. But I have every expectation that things will pick up again in September and we'll be on the move in terms of defending Palestinians and defending Fatima in particular. Um, and, you know, defending the right to free speech, because other than that, then, you know, once essentially, you know, the response was, well, everybody has the right to have free speech. I mean, it's as absurd as everyone has the right to breathe, you know, more unless you're a Palestinian. But I, but I have every expectation that things are going to pick up and um, at least I hope they do. And I know that there are lots of people in the union who want to defend Palestinians and are very, very anti-Zionist. So, you know, that's what's pretty happening at the city university right now.